The birth of Jesus Christ as a prophecy of his death and resurrection. Christmas is one of the most accepted religious holidays for millions of people worldwide. People do not see God as a judge. Instead, they see a young poor couple and their helpless innocent baby born in a manger. In current Western society, you'll come across atheists exchanging gifts even, or making a profit from it. However, a lesser known aspect of Christmas are the circumstances in which Jesus was born represents a prophecy of his death and his resurrection 33 years after his birth. The birth of Jesus discloses the most important details of a master plan that God has made to save his people. There is a symmetry between the birth of Christ and his death and resurrection. There is a series of parallel events that Jesus' birth was carefully designed by God to describe his mission to save people who turn away from him. These events are not displayed on the Christmas postcards that are sent to family and friends, but if we mindfully read the scriptures and compare the beginning and the end of Christ's life on earth, we can clearly see them. Here are some initial parallels typically unthought of. Did you ever notice that angels appear both at birth and at Christ's resurrection? Troubles and pain happen during childbirth and also during the crucifixion. In both events, sorrow turned into joy. First because the long-awaited birth of the Christ child was born, and the second time at the resurrection of the Messiah. Jesus' body was wrapped in linen both at birth and at the time of his death. Fragrances were brought as gifts at the birth and resurrection. Let's look at more parallels and their details. Both Jesus' conception and his resurrection are extraordinary and unusual events. The likelihood that these events occurring by accident at the beginning and at the end of one's life is minuscule. Two key characters at Jesus' birth were Mary and Joseph of Nazareth. Similarly, witnesses of events around Jesus' death and resurrection were another Mary and Joseph, Mary Magdalene and Joseph from Arimathea. So two people with the same names appear at the beginning and at the end of the Gospel. Mary from Nazareth was so trusting in the Lord to risk her reputation, to do what God called her to do. She was a young woman in a small town who carried high moral standards and extreme loyalty to God. People considered her immoral because they could not believe that she conceived a child by the Holy Spirit, but went so far as to assume she conceived by extramarital relationship with Joseph. On the other hand, Mary Magdalene lost any reputation she had because of an immoral life she led. But she recognized and believed Jesus as the Messiah, received forgiveness of her sins, and began a new spiritual life. One morally pure Mary was declared immoral by people, and the other immoral Mary was cleansed, and her moral purity was restored by God. Also, Joseph from Nazareth took care of the newborn Jesus and took him to Egypt to protect his life, while Joseph from Arimathea took care of the deceased Jesus by preparing his body for burial. Let's look further into similarities between Mary of Nazareth and Mary Magdalene. Childbirth is a very painful experience and Mary from Nazareth went into labor and delivery of a newborn under very difficult circumstances, outside of her home, in a stable. Now let's look at Jesus' life later. On the morning of the resurrection, we know that Mary Magdalene was devastated by grief because of Jesus' death. The one who forgave her sins and restored her dignity as a human being, she was crushed. In John 16:20. Grief over Jesus' death, experienced by Mary and his disciples, 
is directly compared to be like labor pain. Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. So Jesus compared the pain of Mary Magdalene and the apostles after his death with pain of a woman in labor. This way Jesus made a clear connection between his birth and his death using the pain and joy people experience in both cases. Notice that Jesus said that joy comes after grief. Sadness and pain of Mary from Nazareth due to labor pains turned into great joy when Jesus was born. Also, sadness of Mary Magdalene became a great joy when she saw Jesus alive in the morning of the resurrection. Mary of Nazareth twice went through this experience of extreme pain that turned into joy. On the day when Mary first brought Jesus to the temple, Prophet Simeon said, A sword would pierce her heart. And this indeed happened when Jesus was condemned to the cross and died. The pain of her son's death turned into great joy at the moment when Jesus was resurrected and when he was born. When reading the Bible, there are many intricate details that are not realized until it is brought to the reader's attention. For example, the Bible says that Jesus was buried in a new tomb in which no one was previously buried. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb cut in the rock, one in which no one had yet been laid. This detail is not essential for Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. However, it is emphasized that Jesus was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, the tomb in which no one before was buried, and not in his grave, as we would expect, and laid it in his own new tomb that was cut in stone. No other story of birth has been so emphasized and storied as Jesus' place of birth, in a manger, instead of a cradle as we would expect. The Bible prophecies predict unusual events or behavior not occurring by chance. That is something that does not happen often. When prophecy has a rare detail, such as a newborn in a manger, it is unlikely that fulfillment will happen by chance. Some biblical prophecies are fulfilled only one time in history. The Bible claims that Jesus' birth was a supernatural event, and Jesus' resurrection from the grave was certainly a supernatural event. In this case, not only was Jesus laid in a tomb in which no one was ever buried, but Jesus came out alive from this tomb. If you are wondering where the parallel event at Jesus' birth is, remember that Mary of Nazareth was a virgin when she gave birth to Jesus. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a husband? Mary had no children before Jesus' birth. Jesus was born miraculously from the womb in which no one has been laid. If this interpretation sounds like a stretch, we should explore how the Bible describes a grave where a deceased person is buried. First, God created the first man, Adam, from the dust of the ground, essentially dirt. And after the fall, men were told when they die, they would return to dust of the earth from which they were created. All the chemical elements of the human body are found in the dust of the ground. But when a man dies, his body decays and returns to the dust of the earth. 
This is why the Bible writers looked at the earth as the womb of humanity, from where all people originate. Furthermore, Jesus described the process of salvation to Nicodemus as a new birth, because the old sinful you must die, and a new you has to be born and live without sin. God also said that he will resurrect all the dead from the ground to receive eternal life or eternal death. When Job went through extreme suffering, he also spoke about the dust where Adam came from as the womb. Job said that as he came naked into this world through the womb of his mother, which means without property, so he will go naked without property back there, meaning he will go to the tomb to decay in dirt, not to go back into the mother's womb. Job also said, And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, meaning that he expected God will resurrect his body from the dust where he will return after he dies. David also compared his mother's womb, where he was woven or created with the depths of the earth. For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. In this biblical analogy between the womb, which was compared with dust, where Adam came from, can be understood and the comparison is clear as how Jesus being born from a virgin womb can symbolize Jesus being raised from the tomb. Joseph and Mary were alone when Mary gave birth. Since Mary just delivered the newborn Jesus, Joseph was the one who washed the blood from the baby's body after birth. God ordered in the Bible regarding uncleanliness from blood that cleansing from blood is necessary, at least to prevent infection. Additionally, the body of the deceased must be washed before the funeral. And in Jesus' case, his body was also washed from blood. Fast forward to Jesus' death. Who was involved in washing the blood from the body? It was Joseph from Arimathea who took the body from Pilate. And Joseph, taking the body, wrapped it in linen clean. After birth, Jesus was swaddled in cloth, as any other newborn would be to prevent hypothermia. After Jesus died, his body was also wrapped in linen. Then they took the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Another instance of custom of wrapping in linen before a burial was when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. The first thing Jesus asked people around the tomb was to remove the linen wrapped around Lazarus. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. In both cases, wrapping in linen was carried out by Joseph. The first time, Joseph from Nazareth, and the second time by Joseph from Arimathea. In this unusual, untraditional crib replacement, baby Jesus resembled the day he was buried in a stone tomb. A swaddled baby in a manger may have looked like a dead man wrapped in linen, and placed in a casket before burial, similar to Jesus before his burial. In both cases, someone else took the burden of care for them, as a baby could not care for himself, and a dead man could not care for himself either. When people imagine how the manger in which Jesus was placed looked like, we have pictured in our mind a wooden crib, because that is what we have seen on Christmas cards and in movies. However, in Syria and Palestine, cribs were carved out of limestone. Cribs made of stone lasted longer than wood. 
Archaeologists found a crib made from limestone in Megiddo, about 3,000 years old, and they claim it is from the stables of King Solomon. A stone crib makes an even more clear parallel between the birth and the burial of Jesus Christ. Jesus was placed in a tomb carved in rock, so the crib in which the child was found, wrapped in linen, looked like a tomb. It is interesting that in both events, birth and death of Jesus, angels announced the good news. And on both occasions, people were scared. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Also, in Luke 24, while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. So, both times, Angels appeared to proclaim good news to the people and to relieve the fear they had at that time. When Christ was born, angels told shepherds that the Messiah was born and he sent them to greet him. Among the spiritual gifts God gave to his people, one gift is to be shepherds. This way, God symbolically represented spiritual care for people, and to guard the flock as shepherds do. After his resurrection, Jesus said to Peter, Feed my lambs, and feed my sheep. Peter appeals also to other elders of the church, Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. Both Peter and John came to the tomb after Jesus rose from the dead. Later, he made his resurrection known to all apostles, and they bowed when they saw the resurrected Jesus, the same way as shepherds were witnesses of the newborn Messiah and praised God for it. Note that the angel told the shepherds they will see a sign to confirm the newborn child is the Messiah. And so you shall find a child wrapped lying in a manger. The Greek word semeon means a sign, a miracle, an extraordinary event. The question is, what kind of sign were they to expect? The fact that this child is wrapped is not specific because every child is swaddled after being born. The unusual fact is that the child was placed in a manger not in a cradle. Shepherds knew they found the Messiah because it was certainly the only newborn placed in a manger that they could find. However, we still wonder what this sign represents. The baby wrapped in linen in the same manner dead people were wrapped, also lying in a carved stone manger? It looks as someone was prepared to be buried The baby was alive, but at birth it looked like it points towards his death. The sign given to shepherds as good news was that this child was born to die and then to be resurrected. The sign was a prophecy that the Messiah would die in the future for the sins of men, who would be wrapped in linen and buried in a stone tomb, but will be resurrected and alive. A sign that angels gave to shepherds was a prophecy about the mission Jesus will accomplish when the time comes. There is another profound meaning of the sign given to shepherds. 
The manger is a place where cattle is fed and offered water. It appears that the Bible indicates that this child placed in a manger will provide spiritual food for spiritual hunger. Child in a manger is also parallel with the Last Supper Jesus had with the apostles one day before his death. At the Last Supper, Jesus offered himself as the bread of life. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Therefore, the place where Jesus was born, Bethlehem, was rightfully named because it means house of bread. Note that the shepherds hurried off to see the baby in a manger, and they came with haste, while Peter and John, as shepherds of God's flock, also rushed to see the empty tomb and confirmed that Jesus was really resurrected. They both ran together, and in both cases they found Jesus wrapped in linen. The next parallel is that fragrances were brought both at birth and after death of the Messiah. The Magi brought gifts of frankincense and myrrh, which was used for anointing the dead to neutralize the odor of body decomposition. They presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Nicodemus brought spices, myrrh and aloe, to Jesus' funeral. And there came also Nicodemus, which at first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound in weight. And the wise men, also at birth, brought myrrh and frankincense. God has a very unique way to reveal his plans. The end of Jesus' life appeared similar to the beginning of his life, even in this detail. The linen soaked in scents were used to wrap Jesus' body. Then they took the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. On the day of resurrection, women also brought fragrances. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Gold and frankincense that the Magi brought points towards the other parts of Jesus' mission for the salvation of men. It is well known that at Jesus' birth, wise men from the East, foreigners, non-Jews, came to see the Messiah. In the similar way, just before the suffering of Jesus Christ, Greeks, also foreigners, non-Jews, came to see Jesus. It is remarkable how Jesus reacted when he heard that some foreigners came to the temple and asked to see him. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The arrival of foreigners to see Jesus as the Messiah was a sign that time has come for him to die and to be resurrected. What do you think? How did Jesus connect the appearance of some foreigners with his death and resurrection? Because the same thing happened when he was born. Foreigners came to see him. If circumstances at Jesus' birth represent a prophecy about his death and resurrection, then the coming of the wise men, who are the foreigners, pointed out that prior to his suffering, some foreigners would also recognize him as the Messiah, and they will come to see him. That's why Jesus said the moment has come for him to be glorified in a manner as a kernel of wheat, has to be buried in the ground to die, just to be able to bring life to a large number of grain, which in the Bible symbolizes 
the resurrection of those who trusted God. When Christ was born, wise men followed a star that led them to the place where Jesus was born. This star was an unusual light, and the wise men noted that it moved differently from the other celestial bodies because it was able to stop above a certain place and then continue to move. It would be understandable that the guiding star represents a group of angels that led the wise men and the shepherds to a place where Christ was born. Let's go forward to Jesus on the cross. An unusual darkness succumbed the day over Jerusalem. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. Jesus' birth was the light of the world, and his death revealed the deep darkness people live in when they reject God. The star could have led the wise men directly to Bethlehem, but it stopped initially above Jerusalem. Why did the star stop first in Jerusalem? Well, because Jerusalem will be covered with darkness on the day when they condemn the Messiah to death. As a consequence, those who rejected the Messiah became very anxious and afraid, while those who recognized the Messiah became overjoyed at Jesus' birth as well as after his resurrection. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. When all the people who had gathered to witness the sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. When Jesus was born, the wise men asked, Where is the one who has been born, King of the Jews? The answer to this question is found at the end of the Gospel. When Pontius Pilate placed a board above Jesus on the cross that read, Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Jesus came to his people and they rejected him while the Magi came to worship Jesus, even though they were strangers. They recognized Jesus not only as a king of Judea, but as the Messiah, the savior of the world. The religious leaders of Israel sought to kill Jesus, as King Herod initially sought to kill him when he heard the wise men seeking the king of the Jews. When Herod sought to kill Jesus, an angel instructed Mary and Joseph to take the baby to Egypt because it was not the time for Jesus to die yet. Later in his life at Gethsemane, an angel encouraged Jesus to willingly surrender himself because his time to die had come. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will but yours be done and an angel appeared from heaven to him, strengthening him. Before the birth of Christ, an angel said to Mary of Nazareth that the Holy Spirit will descend on her to give her God's power. The message was about the Messiah that will be born by a virgin. But listen to the angel's choice of words. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. So, we see that Mary was told that the Holy Spirit will come down on her, and she will receive the power of God. After Christ's resurrection, Jesus gave a similar instruction to his disciples. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. The apostles had to wait until Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured on them and give them power to tell the world about the salvation God provided through the Messiah. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit came upon you. 
Therefore, in both cases, the Holy Spirit came down and gave them power of the Most High. In our individual lives, God also works within us. The Holy Spirit gives us power. We go through some troubles, which will eventually turn into joy, and God will give us eternal life at the second coming of Christ. The evangelist Matthew said that Jesus' birth was a fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy that God would be with his people. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, meaning God with us. At the end of the gospel, Jesus' last words were, And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Why is the birth of Christ important? The symmetry between the birth of Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection is striking and beautiful, but it is not here for aesthetic reasons. With all these similar details and parallels, it becomes clear the intention of the text about Jesus' birth is a prophecy of the Messiah's resurrection. Witnesses of the last days of Jesus' life and his resurrection could have easily made parallels with the events at his birth, the way Mary from Nazareth described all extraordinary events during Jesus' birth. Mirror-like, Jesus' birth reflects major events at the end of Christ's life, including his resurrection. The birth of Christ is an echo of Christ's death and resurrection. Someone who knew what happened when Christ was born could easily understand for what purpose this child was born. Unfortunately, only shepherds and the wise men from distant lands, the minority, paid attention to the birth of the Messiah. Most people were unprepared or disappointed when Christ died, unaware that after his death, his resurrection will follow. God inspired the Bible to us of the significant information we need to know in order to make important decisions for our life. As God has planned and fulfilled parallels between the beginning and the end of Jesus' life, the same way He will fulfill prophecies related to the second coming of Christ before us. Many religious people in Israel did not recognize the Messiah because through their interpretations of the Bible and through their traditions, they lost the original message. Only a small number of sincere people have recognized the Messiah and believe Him. In a similar way, everyone will decide for or against God before the second coming of Christ. Depending on one's own personal decision, whoever has lived on earth God will judge and bring salvation or eternal death to every individual. Before each of us, we have a choice, life with God or death without God. God who showed He is able to save in the past will surely fulfill His plan to remove the sin from the universe and save everyone who repented and returned to Him. We know that God can and wants to save us. So the choice is ours.